Stacy de Lacey knew that his parents would never let him keep anything as stinky and repulsive looking as these monkeys. Luckily, there was a particularly large and slimy rock pool that he knew of around the curve of the cliffs, where nobody but he ever went. He led the monkeys there and watched them pour into the pool. They were as happy under the water as above it. They crouched in the shadows of the pool and looked up at Stacy with wicked, wary eyes. I am your master, he said proudly. After that, Stacy de Lacey turned his thoughts to the sea. If sea monkeys were real, then what other strange things might the ocean hold? Between trips to the rock pool, where he fed and gloated over his growing monkey band, he talked to sailors at the harbour. He peered at old books in secret libraries. He learned of the hallowed shallows. He learned of mermaids and drowned cities. He learned of the rambling isles and of the gathering that they held on the night of the sea wigs. Monkeys are all very well, said Stacy to Lacey to himself, but if I had my own rambling isle, think how powerful I'd be then. He liked the idea of roving the world on his own island, being mean to people. So he started scouring the beach for interesting things the sea washed up, and leaving them above the tide line on a tall rock just offshore. If the night of the sea wigs was real, he thought, no rambling isle would be able to resist such top-notch wig ingredients. And sure enough, one foggy evening, he heard great sloshing footsteps move through the waves towards that rock, and saw a giant shape moving in the mist. He heard the rambling isle grumbling to itself as it sifted through the pile of driftwood and old fishing nets he'd left. This stuff's no good, he heard it say. This won't help me win. Hey, island, shouted Stacy de Lacey. The grumbling stopped. The thing in the fog stood listening. You want to win this stupid sea wigs thing? yelled Stacy. You should steal the best stuff from other islands' wigs. And if you can't do that, just nobble them. Ruin their wigs so they can't win. As luck would have it, the island Stacy was talking to was none other than the bad old Thurlstone, meanest of all the rambling isles. The Thurlstone liked the way this boy thought. How? it asked. With my help, said Stacy, and as the Thurlstone loomed out of the fog to peer down at him, he spread his arms out proudly to show it the gibbering, jabbering swarm of monkeys crowded on the shingle behind him. I have an army of monkeys, he said. That's what the green tide was, pouring out the mouths of the eyes of Thurlstone's old sea stone heads and rushing across the sea. Sea monkeys, small and smelly in their coats of greasy green fur, they giggled horribly as they swam towards cliff or scampered across the mats of drifting weed. Don't mind us, grumbled the weed mats, but the sea monkeys were immune to sarcasm. Up cliff's beaches they rushed, knocking poor Iris off her rock. They sank their teeth and claws into the orange inflatable and popped it, just for laughs. Oliver tried to stop them. He picked up monkeys and hurled them back at the sea, but more were landing all the time and they were scary and dangerous looking. They bared their dirty yellow fangs and screeched at him. The monkey tide sloshed up onto Cliff's bouldery summit and lapped around the water mole. The sea monkeys were so small that Oliver did not think they could shift the submarine, but there were so many of them that they did. The water mole lifted from its perch, afloat again on a sea of snot-green fur. Oliver and Iris had to jump out of the way as the chattering monkeys rushed back with it into the sea. The thurlstone dipped down, till only Stacy's balcony and the old stones and the trees around the temple showed. And the monkeys swam and swirled and struggled and shoved the water mole onto his head. So long, losers, called Stacy to Lacey, waving. We'll see you at the hallowed shallows, if you still think it's worth turning up, of course. The thurlstone turned and moved off. The glass orbs, which were Oliver's parents' prison, bobbed on either side of it, towed on their tethers of rope, with Mr and Mrs Crisp waving sad goodbyes inside them. Sea monkeys went scurrying back to their nests in the old stone heads. The water mole shone so brightly in the slanting sunlight that Oliver could see the gleam of it long after the wicked island had dwindled to a speck on the horizon. That went well, said the watching weed. As the Thurlstone vanished, all Cliff's newfound hopeless, hopefulness drained away. The fight went out of him. Iris and Oliver felt him slump. They couldn't blame him. Poor old giant. So much of his golden sand and drifts of flotsam had been washed away when he stooped to fetch the water mole. Now it was gone. His stony head was even more bare than before. Now what will we do? asked Iris. 
Go after the Thelstone, of course, shouted Oliver. Quick, Cliff, follow them. Cliff lifted his cave mouth out of the waves to say, What's the point? He's beaten me. Then he subsided again. You can't just let him win, said Oliver. Is he the sort of island who deserves to win the Knight of the Sea Wigs? And as for that Stacy de Lacey, go after them and get the water mole back. How? rumbled Cliff. They have an army of monkeys. He's got a point, said Iris. Then go to the Hallowed Shallows, insisted Oliver. Tell everyone what Stacy and his Thulstone did. They won't listen to me, said Cliff warily. They'll be too busy admiring the Thulstone's marvellous sea wig and laughing at me. So what are you going to do? Iris asked. Cliff sighed. I'm going to settle, he decided. No, yelled Oliver. I should have done it years ago, Cliff went on. What's the point of all this tramping around, collecting stuff? I'm going to stand here and grow roots and forget I was ever a rambler. I'll become just an island. That's all I'm good for. I'm useless. Finished. Washed up. He sank back slowly into the sea. No, shouted Oliver again. He did a dance of frustration, shin deep in the wavelets which washed Cliff's shores. But no amount of stamping or shouting would make Cliff come up again. Oliver remembered the sad, lifeless settle isles which Irish had shown him on the way to the sarcastic sea. He imagined the sand and silt slowly piling up around Cliff's feet. Oh dear, said Iris, with salt tears dripping off her chin. I think he means it. Now look what you've done, sniffed Mr Culpepper, fussily rearranging his nest, which had been terribly knocked about by those swarming sea monkeys. If you hadn't dragged us here in search of that stupid wreck, this would never have happened. It's all your fault. Well, I'm not going to let Stacy de Lacey win, said Oliver. Years of exploring had taught him that you don't solve problems by sitting around complaining about them. You have to do something. That's how his mum and dad had saved him from that Komodo dragon. That's how they'd escaped from the dungeons of Mabumi, Mabumi. He struck an explorer-ish pose on the shore and said, I'm going to go after that Thurlstone and show it that it can't just go around snitching other people's shipwrecks and kidnapping mums and dads. That's all very well and good, said Iris, but... Army of monkeys, remember? Oh, and your boat's gone all flop. Oliver ignored the reminder about the monkeys. He hadn't yet thought of any way that he could deal with them. He had an answer to the part about the boat, though. He opened his explorer's pack and triumphantly pulled out a foot pump and a punctured dinghy repair kit. One hour of patching and pumping later, he was ready. He shoved the dinghy into the waves and hoisted himself aboard. He tugged the motor's starter cord. It didn't work. It never did. You need big muscly arms like Dad's to start it. Iris looked on doubtfully. I suppose I could help, she said. Oh yes, you'll be a lot of use, snapped Oliver, so sarcastically that even the seaweed was shocked. Your arms are even feebler than mine. Oh, I don't mean like that, sniffed the mermaid. She unhooked the motor from the stern of the dinghy and dropped it on the shore. Then, before Oliver could ask how that was supposed to help, she scrambled half aboard the dinghy with her tail hanging off behind. Shove off, she said. Ooh, isn't she rude, whispered the weed admiringly. I mean, shove the dinghy off, Oliver shoved. As the dinghy drifted into deeper water, Iris started to flap her tail up and down, driving them away from the shore. It was difficult to steer at first, but they soon work it, worked it out. Iris took the dinghy on a farewell circuit of the island. Oliver looked over the side, down through the waves at the great dim cliff face of Cliff's face loomingly there. He couldn't see if Cliff's eyes were open or closed. He couldn't tell if the rambling isle was watching his friends leave or just too sad to care. He waved anyway. Mr Culpepper flapped over the perch of the dinghy's prow. I might as well come with you, he said. After all, you'll need help finding the thieving island, I suppose. So the albatross took off again, soaring towards the horizon, and the mermaid-powered dinghy followed him, splashing along the lane of open water which the Thurlstone had left through the sarcastic weed. It was tiring work for poor Iris. Every few minutes she had to stop and rest while Oliver refuelled her by feeding her caramel bars from his lunchbox, but at last the sarcastic sea was left behind. 
I wonder why Stacy de Lacey is so keen to help the Thelgstone win the contest anyway, wondered Oliver. But Iris was too busy being an outboard motor to reply. Mr Culpepper flew above them, calling down directions. At first there was no need, for Oliver and Iris could see the Thelstone far ahead. But as the day wore on, the thieving island drew away from them, and a strange haze arose. Soon it was hard for even the sharp-eyed albatross to see very far. "'We are coming near the hallowed shallows,' said Iris. They began to pass another rambling isle. At first they looked like normal islands, but they were all moving and all in the same direction, and white wakes of foam stretching behind them. Some were as small and tatty as Cliff, some were magnificent. There was one who had sculpted a sort of volcano on his upper part and lit a fire in it so trails of smoke rings mingled with the haze. There was one who had drizzled wet sand onto her hair to build up teetering pinnacles and spires and another who had arranged miles and miles of weed into a massive beehive with a small ship stuck in the middle of it. None of them paid the slightest attention to the dinghy. If only Cliff was here, said Oliver, feeling sad that they had left their own rambling isle behind. The rest would only laugh at him, said Iris. Some of those sea wigs are to die for. Meanwhile, back in the sarcastic sea, Cliff was thinking sadly of his friends. He had never had actual people living on him before and he missed them now that they were gone. Not only that, the seaweed had drifted closer now that he was not moving, and it just kept jeering and sniggering at him and saying how brave it thought he was. No, he told himself, it's no use worrying. I've had enough. All these years wandering and gathering things just so some other isle can pinch them. That's it. I'm settling here. Maybe one day someone will put another danger submerged rock sign on me. And he shut his eyes and sank his toes down deep into the seafloor silt and tried to stand as still and lifeless as any other rock on the ocean. But he could not, not stop his mind from working. He could not stop himself thinking. He thought how wrong it was that the Thirlstone was allowed to roam around wrecking other people's wigs. Then he thought sadly that the water mole was the best thing he had ever, ever found. Then he thought that actually Oliver and Iris were the best things he had found. He began to worry about them. He began to think that maybe the jeering weed was right to hint that he had been cowardly. Maybe Oliver had been right. Maybe he should go to the hallowed shallows and tell the other isles what the rotten hearted Thirlstone was up to. Somebody's got to do something, he said out loud. And Oliver and Iris are too small, and Mr Culpepper is just an albatross, so that somebody must be, uh, me. Ooh, said all the seaweed, tittering in that annoying way it had. But it soon stopped, for Cliff was on the move again, striding and swimming as quickly as he could towards the same horizon that Oliver's dinghy had vanished over. <laughs>